Hello, my name is Lois Simons and I'm the owner of Gardening by Nature's Design. This garden here in the Lakeshore District is Marianne and Richard's garden. When I first came to this garden, there was no stone on this side of the garden other than the few couple of stones that were bordering the entryway. And to create a balance and a connection between one side of the garden to the other, uh, we put in a wall. Also because uh, there was a height differential. There was quite a slope here, and we wanted to mitigate that slope and, um, and create more um, moderate slope, more level land. So we put in this stone wall bed. It is also made of we utilizing the same stone that was used over there. It's a river rock stone. And because of its nature, um, we kind of played that out. And because we wanted a natural looking wall, not an architectural wall, we allowed it to curve and move throughout the garden. And the other thing is we really accentuated, almost like flying fish, the shape of the stones, rather than fitting them tightly together, we allowed them to flow one over the other, kind of falling into place as stone naturally would. And you see that? It's like a dolphin cresting a wave. There were several coffee berries here, and this, this here is a coffee berry. It had a just a, maybe half a dozen, a dozen leaves on it. It was pretty paltry. Once again, we did these with the soil test and we amended the soil. And as you can see, it has recovered and is flourishing. The same is true of the other coffee berries. This was really sparse and meager and uh, they were yellow. So I just want to point out, and you can see there's lots of bees and wasps in this garden. Marianne has noticed how much more um, life there is in this garden, how many more birds are visiting this garden, insects, um, and I will show you later we've had butterflies. And so it's not static, it's a dynamic ecosystem here that we're beginning to create. Perhaps just the beginnings, the basics of it, but it does have the, enough coherence to bring in wildlife, raccoons, deer, squirrels, and, um, and the things, the pollinators. This is, I mentioned the sunset manzanita or arctostaphylis before. This is it at a further stage. We have flowering plants in front of the wall. This is the penstemon, Heterophilus margarita BOP, and it borders both sides of the walkway. You'll no notice here are the stakes that we used to protect initially plants from the deer. And we kept these here because we are also protecting this particular one from dogs. <laughs> This is a buckwheat, and here is a monkey flower. I use the um, Mimulus or Diplicus uh, orientiacus um, varieties. This is the changeling, um, one of my favorites. And here is a buckwheat and another monkey flower. So we create a pattern language here. We have the monkey flowers here, there, and then around the bend. And then in between we have the buckwheat. We also wanted to create some kind of connection and fluidity between the upper bed and the lower bed. So we have the grasses here that feed into a grass below. It's a smaller area, so we have a smaller grass here. This is the eyelash grass, Butilea. And I'm just going to point out an eyelash. This will be covered in eyelashes. It is fantastic and just so playful and fun. 
So you can see how the grasses flow from the upper bed down and will flow to the lower bed. This buckwheat has come uh, along a, a lot. It's uh, much bigger and you can see it's, it's budding out. We broke this up with a fuchsia, California fuchsia. And we have here the um, yarrow, Achillea millefolium, and this is the red flame. I find it to be a particularly strong yarrow, and we have it here in the upper bed and lower bed, once again creating the connection. This Starrer's Choice salvia will fill the upper part of the bed, the backdrop here, and it makes a nice counterpoint to the emerald carpet in front. We have a new one here, so it's going to fill this entire bed. A back bed, I should say. This is another salvia. Uh, it's a whirly blue, and uh, it has beautiful purple flowers that come in swirls, as you can begin to see. And we're hoping it will fill, it's intended to fill this entire area here. Behind it is a uh, an Arctostaphylis, and you can see um, from just the few Arctostaphylis that I have pointed out, these manzanitas are very diverse. Some are flat ground covers, some are uh, curving, sweeping ground covers, some get high, some remain low, and some are shrubs and trees. Some lose their lower leaves, some retain them. This is a Louis Edmund, and it's a tree, a uh, shrub, and it comes to about six feet. So it will come up to the, just the, above the bottom of this window. And we're going to set, uh, lightly espalier it. And so it will define this breakfast nook space. It is also mirrored by this Arctostasvus Louis Edmund, and which is also positioned to mirror the other one. And it will also spread in similar fashion this way, so that there will be a correlation and mirroring between the two and a connection between the two beds. In this bed, we used grasses and um, primarily grasses, some uh, manzanitas as well, to create a pattern. And once we had that pattern set, this spring we planted the um, annual pollinating plants to extend the pollinating season. See grasses, remember the continuity between the upper and lower levels in the main bed. But so we're going from grass over to grass. And we're continuing following the grasses throughout this uh, street side garden. It was wonderful to have such a wide bed street side that we could develop like this. We're utilizing the grasses to set up a pattern throughout the bed as well as the manzanitas. And then within that pattern um, are the pollinators. The gold bud, Solodago californica, Tidy tips, Amaria, and this is another grass which I will show you. Um, this is the Calamagrostis foliosa. It's really pretty grass. Several poppies, and the tidy tips once again, and more poppies. And here we come upon the California fescue that is in the main bed, along with the carrots that are in the main bed. And right before this uh, grass on either side of it is the milkweed. And that attracts um, the caterpillar for the monarch butterfly. So I planted the milkweed closely together. There are three of them. And so I have discovered uh, with the milkweed in terms of drawing the caterpillars and the butterflies that it's best to plant them uh, together, close 
together rather than one here and one very far apart. And that it has been more, much more successful in drawing in the caterpillars. And it was wonderful watching them crawl throughout the garden. But what it made me realize is that while they feed on the milkweed, they don't cocoon on the milkweed. And it's just as important, not simply to provide milkweed for the caterpillars, but to provide plants for the cocoon, for the ca caterpillar to cocoon. And that plant has to have a strong leaf with a nice arch to it so that it can tolerate and accept the weight of that cocoon. And so um, the coffee berries are a good example of that. They uh, are able to cocoon uh, in the coffee berries. There are other plants as well, but um, that's something that um, is important to incorporate in your garden if you're thinking of bringing in the caterpillars for the monarch butterfly or any other butterfly for that matter. Okie dokie. We also have here um, buttercups, California ranuncula. And um, throughout the garden are the blue-eyed grass. Uh, you see it in the backdrop here and stuff. And we're allowing it to be slightly wild and then we will thin it out and uh, as we've done before, we've, we've potted a great deal of them and uh, give them to people for restoration or for their own gardens. We have the coyote bush pigeon point here and we continue it in the street side, once again uniting the beds. And here we have the Calamagrosis foliosa, a little more mature and stuff with this seedling to give you a sense of um, its form. So it was really important, this second stage of planting, to extend um, the pollinator plants for pollinators to be able to come and, and make use of this garden. So we're extending the season and uh, it's been a joy to do so.